Well, I'd like to introduce our last speaker tonight. And I know that when uh, they contacted me and told me that Jim was going to come and speak, they gave me a couple of different topics. I thought, how to live as Christ followers in a world that rejects him. Now, that's something that really interests me and that I'm very, very curious about because that is a challenge. So, Jim Daly, would you come up and share this? Jim Daly of Focus on the Family. Give him a good round of applause. <laughs> Woo! All right, you got to stand up. You guys have been sitting a long time. Come on. I've been doing enough of these. I know, I know you guys are going, one more speaker. But it's been great. I really appreciate the opportunity to be in front of the Barnabas group. While you're standing and stretching, uh, I'll just tell you a quick story. So when I took over at Focus on the Family, the Denver Post called, and they wanted to do a story on our family. And I got home, and I told my wife, Jean, hey, the Denver Post wants to come to the house. She's like, what? So we had two, still have two boys, but uh, they're now 13 and 15. But at the time, I think they were literally four and six. And uh, the reporter had heard that I tell my boys I love them every day, which I do. And so she wanted to kind of find out if this is true. So she says to my kids, you know, your dad says something to you every day. What is it? And Troy, my then like four-year-old, said, eat your vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and my other one, not wanting to be outdone, says, go to bed on time. And then they just, like, rattled off about ten things each. And it was so funny because this reporter, when the kids walked away, she goes, you know, that was really uh, good to see. I was expecting Stepford children. Isn't that crazy? She thought, focus on the family. I thought your kids would be like little robots. I thought, oh, yeah, get out of my house. Anyway, <laughs> let's sit down. I love a little boy, uh, not long ago, a little boy uh, focused on the family. We have a prayer uh, thing where kids that visit, we have about 200,000 visitors a year, most of them in the summertime. And uh, this little eight-year-old wrote this prayer request, which we have in the Welcome Center. And it said, which was very kind, please pray for my brother, he, he wets the bed. Isn't that sweet? Then it said, P.S., please pray for me. I share a bed with my brother. <laughs> I just love that one. I mean, that's like, that's it. Yeah, Lord, I want to pray for this guy, but really, it's about me. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? <laughs> I mean, that's what, we are selfish creatures, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about that tonight. There's so many thoughts going through my head right now, and uh, what great setups all the way. I was going to talk about Leviticus, uh, thanks to Morgan. Morgan, where are you there? I wanted to preach to you tonight about Leviticus. That's a joke about Leviticus. Thank you for that yawn. I saw that yawn. Uh, but actually, really this idea of how do you live as a Christian, we've, we've really got to listen to the word. I mean, that's what counts. And I, what I love is being on the airplane. And, I, you know, I struggle doing daily devotions. Any other guy in the room struggle doing daily devotions? And we've got two kids playing football. We, I mean, we're up. We're busy. But when I'm on an airplane, which I'm a, on an airplane a lot, I like to just listen to the word. Because it's just a great way to, to hear. And in fact, on this trip, I went to Seattle and now down here, and I was able to listen to all the book of John. And we got, we got kind of a tough situation in our family right now. We got Jean's mom in Garden Grove. She's there right now. She's in her last probably few days dying of cancer, and she's not a believer. So I'm literally, I was there all afternoon. I'm going back after talking tonight because she's more alert late at night. So I'm going to jet out of here and go spend time with my unbelieving uh, mother-in-law just to see if there's a moment where we could talk to her about the Lord. So appreciate your prayers for that tonight. Um, that's heavy on my heart. But when I look at, when we look at the culture and I look at where we're at, hey, there is no recrimination about where we've come from. I think, uh, you know, when you look at the cultural difficulties, the battles, um, those that have gone before me and before many of us, uh, you know, they were trying to hold on to good things. The one question that haunts me, though, is if we were in the right place with the Lord in this country, why did so many people walk away from it? Is that a fair question to ask? I think it is. And my only conclusion is maybe we weren't quite where we needed to be in terms of our humility and what we need to be. What I loved about the presentations uh, throughout the night, all of them were action-oriented, you know, working on college campuses, being engaged with distributing the Word of God. I, I think that's where it's at. If you look at the early church about the establishment of hospitals and hospices, that's our Christian tradition. Saving babies thrown away at the dumps of Rome. We were the ones that, our forefathers and mothers, were the ones that created orphanages. It's an incredible heritage that we have. And I think we've got to get back to it. We did that orphan care 
at uh, focus on the family. So we, we've gotten involved in foster care. And I came out of the foster system. Morgan, I was born in West Covina, too. <laughs> it sounds very similar. <laughs> All kind of tits to the, tilts to the armpit of West Covina, doesn't it? <laughs> but my goodness, I mean, it was just tough. And so I spent a year, and the foster father I was under when I was nine years old uh, told the social worker I tried to kill him. It was ridiculous. I mean, it was just a, no. <laughs> Somebody in there was going, did you? <laughs> no. I didn't try to kill him. It was fabricated. But I'm, I'm nine years old going, these people don't know the truth, you know? And uh, that really has been kind of the core for me is what is the truth and where you find the truth is in the Word of God. There's no other place to find the truth. And so for me, part of it is just a challenge, always looking at the log in our own eye. And so you talk about, Jim, a little bit of a challenge tonight. Let me share some thoughts, some scriptures. Ninety percent of what I'm going to talk about is just scripture. I shared this in a group, and I got an email from somebody who said that was the most condescending speech I've ever heard. Seriously, I said, oh, Lord, I know what you felt when the Pharisees were. The next email I got was from a gay activist who I've developed a friendship with. He sent me a note saying, your talk tonight moved me closer to the heart of God. It, 30 seconds apart, those two emails came into me. Isn't that amazing? So let me just go through some of it. I know, and let me say, it, it can be. I'm not meaning this to be condescending. I'm just trying to be challenging. What does the Word of God say? How many of you want to live under the old covenant? I'm just curious. Do you remember that part of Scripture where the, the disciples are saying, who can carry the yoke of Moses? We can't even carry it. You remember that? That's pretty, pretty straightforward. Nobody can carry the yoke of Moses. And I'm so glad we live in this time under the, the grace of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm talking about. I want to be vibrant and alive in the new covenant that the Lord has established. I can't live under the old one. I'm not good enough. That's the bottom line. So let's just look at some scripture. So this is where I just want to point to it, because it doesn't matter what Jim Daly thinks, actually. Just ask my wife. <laughs> Let me, Second Timothy. Here's a good one. The Lord's servant must not be... Now this, I mean, I did not draft these. You can go check these out, right? The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. I'd say most people. Kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Patiently enduring evil. Correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I mean, you look at those words in there. Enduring, patiently enduring evil. Uh, correcting with gentleness. I've had people say to me, those are too effeminate, those qualities. Is that crazy? I mean, it's right there in the Word. Romans 2.4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? God's kindness. Does anybody in here know somebody who's been beaten into the kingdom of God? Verbally, you're so horrible, except Jesus. Okay. It usually doesn't work that way. It's, hey, we're all broken. We all need a Savior. Jesus has paid the price. Isn't that how it usually goes? Yeah. But somehow we've got this weird thing saying, if I really point my finger at you and get after you, somehow that's going to pull you in. And I just don't think that's it. I think, in fact, when Jesus said, love your neighbor, there is something profound in that that we kind of, we just sail right by it. When you are sitting with somebody who opposes you and everything you believe is a Christian, but they see love they see sincerity. Let me just say it this way. They see the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not complicated. I think the Lord knew 2,000 years later they might have it a little wrong, so let me just write it down. If you're in me, here's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, mercy, all those effeminate qualities. Sorry to say it that way, but guys, you know, ladies do represent a piece of God. Am I, t am I stepping on toes? I mean, it's true. It's so true. And what takes strength? I'll tell you what takes strength. So uh, the 21 martyrs, 
the men that were killed by ISIS, right? You all know the story? On the beach or wherever it was, they took their heads off. I was ticked. Right, guys? I was mad. I drove home that night on the way to see my boys and Jean, and I thought, you know what, Lord? A good thing to do would be for us to finish the houses, right? Those 21 young men went to get money in Libya and send it back to the, basically the dumps in Cairo so they could build an 8 by 8 cinder block house with a tin roof. So we have an office in Cairo. I called Sammy Yacoub. I said, Sammy, find out how much it would cost to finish the job. I think this is a holy moment. I want to do something for these families. So we checked it out. $247,000 that included a tractor so they can generate revenue back to the business tree. And, uh, and we've gone about doing it. They're almost completed. So I'm talking to Sammy on the phone like, well, no, no, praise the Lord. I mean, that's, and I'll tell you what, it was four phone calls. That's how quick it was, four donors. I just said, there was like a, my, it was awesome. That's a holy donation, I think. You are doing something incredible with that. And so I'm talking to Sammy on the phone, and Sammy says, Jim, the families are weeping. I said, Sammy, of course they're weeping. My ticked attitude. Their loved ones were killed, martyred. Yes, they're weeping. Sammy says, no, no. They're weeping with joy that God would count them worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Okay, I just kind of sat in my really big, oversized chair at Focus on the Family. Kind of dramatization. Nice office, though. And I went, okay, Lord, I got the message. The illiterate Christians from... Egypt, the dumps of Cairo, who can't read or write, just taught the MBA guy a huge spiritual lesson, lesson in what it means to be Christian, right? They counted a joy to suffer for Jesus. I wanted to go kill the people that killed them. That's horrible. That's my flesh. That's my human nature. And I'm just saying we've got to bridle that human nature as we move forward in the political arena, in every arena. If we lose the character of Christ in any of these battles, we lose. Because first and foremost, we have to be Christian. And we can look to the early church. We can look all throughout church history. We are acting fearful because we don't believe God's in control. Are we able to believe even if we die for the sake of Christ that he's in control? I don't think we are, and we better get ready. It may not come to that, but it's no longer uh, cultural Christianity. It's convictional Christianity. You're going to have to pay a price to believe what you believe, and it's happening now. But it doesn't mean we get angry. We just got to get back to Christ. Let me read a couple more. I love this quote by Blaise Pascal. This really gets it. There are two kinds of men, the righteous who believe themselves sinners, the rest sinners who believe themselves righteous. Did you get that? It's late. (laughs) There are two kinds of men, the righteous who believe themselves sinners, sinners, and the rest sinners who believe themselves righteous. We've got to guard our hearts. We have got to guard our hearts. 1 Thessalonians 5, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. (laughs) Do we really do that? Honestly. That parking spot was mine. So, I mean, not many years ago, probably seven years ago, this young punk, dramatization, cuts me off. I'm in a parking spot, and I'm backing up, and this guy goes through the parking lot doing about 40. I'm not kidding. And he, he gave me a hand gesture on the way by. I'm thinking, what have I done? I am a righteous driver here. And that guy's a really unrighteous, heathen driver. So I went to sort him out. So I followed him two blocks. He caught on. He pulled over. He got out of the car. He's running at my car. I get up out of the car. And thankfully, he's like half my size. I played football. He didn't. And uh, he stops about 10 feet from me. And it was a Sunday afternoon, and I had a blazer on. Not smart. And he goes, ah, just go back to church. And I go, and all these people in the left-hand turn lane have their windows down. They're all listening to us because they're going to see this big fight, you know. And I said, 
just drive better. It's the best thing I could come up with. And I get back in the seat and I sit down. I honestly, I heard the Holy Spirit say, how'd that go for you? I mean, it's like, really? Really? I want him to you, Lord. I beat him into heaven for you. That horrible, unrighteous driver. But it's kind of what we do with other people in our lives. Like, Gay activists and abortionists. And so when Jesus says, love your neighbor, when you're sitting across the table from a person like that, and they feel sincerity from you, and they feel heart, you don't have to agree with them. That's what I found. It's amazing. I've got gay activists that meet in my office. Yeah, at Focus, I know some of you might be mad about that. But I've had guys go, I know you're going to disagree with me, but I felt I needed to come and talk to you. And about 70% of the ones I've met with come from Christian homes. Yep. Probably the closest person I know in that community, one of the architects of what's happened, sadly, comes from a Christian home, Church of Christ. Went to church four times a week. Was an only child. Grew up, grew up on a farm in Kansas. Doesn't get any better, does it, guys? And he came home from college, realized since he was three, he felt this had never been able to shake it, one of the biggest mistakes we make, saying it's just a choice. When you meet with these guys, it's not. And he said to me, my dad, I told my mom and dad, my dad stood up, hugged me, burst into tears, stepped back from me and said, I love you, but I never want to see you again. And then his dad died three years later. You don't think there's some pain in these people's hearts? We've got to look way beyond the political fray. And that's what I think Jesus does. Let me just run through a few more. C.S. Lewis, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is left in him. Is that good? When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. That's a, a way that Jesus said, you know, to the Pharisees, right? Titus 3, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready, to do whatever is good, to slander no one. Ooh, I think I may have just... Mess that one up today, watching Fox News, which I enjoy. <laughs> Slander no one, be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men, not just conservatives. That's really hard. Let me, let me just talk about Luke. You all know Luke chapter 6, the golden rule. This is the golden rule. one. You ever read the paragraphs ahead of that golden rule? It's kind of the precursor. It tells you what the golden rule is all about. I mean, I mean, we taught our kids the goal, you know, do unto others you want them to do unto you, right? But listen to what sets it up. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Do good to those who hate you. <laughs> I don't like doing that. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn them the other one also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do unto you, right? I mean, that is, are we really living that? It goes on. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit's that to you? Even sinners do that. But love your enemies. I, you can't get around this stuff, folks. I'm sorry, but it just is right there. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them. And why? It says, then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. I, I'm struggling with these, script, these scriptures. I'm not saying I'm there, I arrived. I don't mean this to be condescending. It's like, this is challenging to me. Is it to you? Does anybody, do you have it wired? I mean, this is the most contrary thing to human character that we possess, is treating people that don't like us well. And we don't do it well. 1 Corinthians, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. We're getting a little deeper now, Jim? Okay, let me just ask you this question. Have we totally flipped this? We are so hard on the world, who could care less about what and how we believe. And we're really easy on each other. 
Where's the accountability in Christian leadership to be humble? Talking about the pro-life movement, working together, Kathleen, for a common goal. That's awesome. Where's the humility to do it? These are tough scriptures. Mm. Let me, Colossians will end here. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you, you may not, you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let me, let me end with this story. So I got a phone call at Focus. I, I don't think I've even shared this publicly. But I had a phone call at Focus from a person who gave a healthy six-figure gift regularly. And he said, Jim, I just don't think you should meet with these people. And I really don't think I can give to Focus if you keep meeting with people like that, meaning gay activists and abortionists. I said, well, I've got to share the gospel with them. And he said, well... And I said, I've got to be really clear. I don't mean to be um, disrespectful with what I'm about to ask you, but are you blackmailing me? And I, I mean, really? He said, well, it's like you want to be their friend. I said, you know that is in Scripture where Jesus <laughs> was called a friend of sinners. I mean, wow. Wow. But we have a fear that if we meet with people like that, we're going to capitulate. And that's a fair fear. But you got to have people that aren't going to capitulate that are going to meet with people like that, that are going to say, you know what? Truth is truth. I remember a, a, a gay man at a book signing raised his hand. I said, yeah. And he said, uh, when will you Christians get over your really archaic sexual viewpoints and get caught up to the 21st century? <laughs> wow, okay. Uh, next question. I said, uh, you know, that is amazing that you want to make me the editor of the book. But I'm not the editor of the book. I'm a follower of the book. I have no authority to edit the text. I mean, and let me tell you, I'd love to take an eraser and remove some of those things like, if you've looked upon a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. Can we just get rid of that? Let's edit that one out. Right, guys? I mean, really? I'm sitting here going, so I... I I said, I hear you, but I said, we, we, just can't, we just can't get rid of the text. You can hold on to your principles in these discussions. And the great thing is, it's like that guy that sent the email. You're moving me closer to the heart of God. The, uh, I'll tell you, we got one minute, five minutes. Okay, I'll tell you this last story. So, <laughs> is that right? Is that right? You just showed me a 10-minute sign. Hey, replace this guy. Uh, <laughs> so a, a, a woman who worked in the abortion industry came to meet with me because on the radio I said, you know, if you're wanting to make abortion rare, I'd love to talk to you. Y you think that's fair? Now, listen, this isn't blind. I'm trying to flesh them out because if they use that terminology, Kathleen, safe, legal, and rare, and you say, okay, let's make it rare, and they go, well, we really don't want to. I mean, that's what they're really doing. So you can, you know, use a little smarts to do this. So, so anyway, she came to the office. She was literally shaking like this. I'm not exaggerating. And I went, I'll call her Cindy. I said, Cindy, are, are you okay? She said, well, my friend said you're going to put a voodoo hex on me. <laughs> I'm serious. And she was serious. I started laughing just like, yeah, I thought she, what a great sense of humor. And then I realized she thinks it's true. I said, Cindy, w what do you know about Christianity? Nothing. All I know is you want to kill us. I am serious, you guys. She was 50 years old. I went, wow. So I took a half hour, talked to her about the gospel, who Jesus was, what he claimed. Um, it's amazing. She went home that night, and her husband of 27 years left her a note. I'm leaving you. And guess who she called? focus on the family. And uh, Kelly Rosati, who was in the meeting with me, Kelly walked with her through everything, helped give her resources to think through all of it. And she, she sent me an email probably six months later saying, I've never met a human being, love another human being the way Kelly has loved me. <laughs> Is that crazy? She's like so close to accepting Christ. She's left the abortion industry. Now, I'd only say some Christian leaders that were, who heard that I had met with people like this were 
very negative toward me meeting like this. And they weren't even in the meeting. They didn't know what happened. I mean, and you talk about, wow, okay. Isn't this what we're supposed to do is get engaged with the world? Everything we heard tonight, engage the world. Engage the world. Kathleen, what you're doing at the clinics, engage the world. And where it says, you know what? The world is going to hate you, but be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. No, we're going, the world's going to hate you, and Lord, I am really ticked at the world because of that. That's not what the Scripture says. Be of good cheer. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, mercy. we got to develop the fruit of the Spirit. You ever read the other part, the bad fruit? Division, disunity. Oh, yeah, all the sexual stuff's there, too. Immorality, I get that. But you look at the end of that list, it's all the stuff we're doing. Sowing seeds of discontent. Wow! The Lord was so good, he said, let me write it down for you. If you're rooted in me, these will be the fruits that people should see in you. I had one Christian leader say to me, I really don't have much of this or much of that. I was going, I don't think it's a menu you order from. <laughs> you know, take a half a pint of patience. and You know, if you're weak in an area, we, your Christian friends, should be saying, hey, I noticed something. That's where we are weak. And we don't want anybody to help us in our fruit. You know, let me, I'll take care of my own garden. Thank you. I'll weed it. I'll water it. Don't talk about my garden and my fruit. <laughs> Isn't that how we're doing it? It's crazy. I should be saying, come into my garden. Help me grow better fruit in my life. We should be anxious for that. Help me! Instead, a lot of Christian leadership is, get away from me. Isn't it? Wow! Listen to the book of John, how Jesus goes after the Pharisees. He goes after them and says, you know what? I healed a blind man. And, you know, the way the blind man says, oh, isn't this interesting? This man you say isn't of God could do something so good in my life, like heal me from blindness, and you say he's not of God. How could that be? What did they respond with? Who are you to lecture us? That's what they say. Who are you to lecture us? And so much of Christian leadership is saying that today to people who don't have theology degrees that are just doing the job. And I just think we need to look inside and hold each other accountable to living the Christian walk, reducing our divorce rates, reducing abortion, so that when we sit with people who oppose us, they can at least say, we respect you for how you live your life. They don't say that today. What they say is, you're no better than us. That's what they say. So let me just challenge you in that way. I appreciate it, Jim. Thanks. And uh, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, tonight we found out that apartments and child care are important to God. Most of us didn't know the word business tree until we got here tonight. We found out how we can impact college students. Most of us know how important that is, but would three mornings a year be too much to take somebody to breakfast? We found out what's going on in the fight to save unborn children. Now, I would bet most of us didn't know about that pill that will end a baby's life in just a couple days. We found out how we can reach the last of the unreached people groups, and how close we are to fulfilling the Great Commission. What an exciting thing that is. We found out how much our work matters because it's our walk. We're challenged. Why the Barmers Group? If you're not a member, shouldn't you be? We also found out that Jim Daly's kids eat their vegetables. <laughs> They're supposed to. But we're challenged by the fact, are we convicted Christians? Do we really love others? Do we love those who are pretty unlovable sometimes? Let's pray for the night. Father, I just uh, thank you so much for the people that uh, came out. They gave up an evening to come here to be challenged, to be connected, to see what you might put in their path, Lord, to see how you might uh, introduce them to somebody that maybe they didn't know before. Maybe it was a ministry that spoke tonight, and Lord, that 
their heart was pierced and that they might come alongside that ministry with their time, their talent, their network, their treasure, and somehow get involved with that ministry. And Lord, we look forward to seeing what you might do there. Or maybe it was somebody they just met at their table that they developed a friendship with. And who knows where that might go, Lord, and what that might develop into and how you might use it to extend your kingdom. So, Father, surprise us and uh, just give everybody a great night, uh, safe drive home. And I hope that each one of you talks about tonight something you heard, something you were challenged with, something you were encouraged with as you leave this place tonight. Thanks for coming out. We just lift this evening up to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys very much.